Okay, so I suppose there are three strands in um, the way I want to approach this project. One of them has to do with the history of political thought, the other has to do with intellectual history, and the third has to do more with political theory. In the history of political thought strand, the idea is to look at the 20th century and understandings of conspiracy over the course of the 20th century, specifically how they shift. They seem to shift in the early course of the 20th century. Conspiracies tend to be located more in the mass of the people and small subversive groups who are going to take over and overthrow the old established elite. And this seems to shift over the course of the 20th century, where instead of being when, um, groups within the mass, subversive groups within the mass, it's government itself and democracy itself that seem to be um, a conspiracy against the people. So I want to explore how that shift happens and my inclination is to think that perhaps in terms of political thought this shift happens with um, in, the, in the kind of mid 20th century, um, or slightly earlier perhaps, with people like Robert Michael's The Study of Political Parties, where he looks at social democrats, the social democrats in Germany who claim to be ruling um, in a democratic manner, in which if they were to take over then um, in Germany they would also rule in a democratic manner. And he studies this and is like, no, no, there's actually an iron law of oligarchy. Um, so one of the first questions I want to ask then is, well, is that one of the ways we get the shift? And as part of the project, which we say that we'd work in a kind of collaboration with David Runciman, is to analyze these people like Robert Michaels, Moscow and Pareto and see whether we can understand their theories of elite democracy as something like a conspiracy. So that's the first strand I think I would like to investigate within the project. The second strand has to do um, with intellectual history, and this is something um, Alfred and I said we'd try to work on um, together to try to develop something like a genealogy of conspiracy theory. Um, <clears throat> and what's meant by that, I think the, the kind of thought is sparked by a remark by Bruno Latour, who says that, well, he finds it very hard to make a distinction between critical theory and conspiracy theory to, today, in a way that conspiracy theory has kind of vulgarized critical theory, but use many of the same tools. So it's about debunking um, the kind of official line and seeing what's behind it. Um, and there seems to be an interesting parallel there. And so the idea is to try to trace that back and see what the intellectual influences that come into conspiracy theory, which obviously take on a slightly vulgarized form. But there, there may be a link with that. Um, um, conspiracy theory with the broader project of enlightenment and the critique of enlightenment. So I think we want, to, both of us want to explore that to see that we hope drawing kind of some kind of intellectual history of conspiracy theory will ho hopefully shed light on conspiracy theory and make us better understand it. Um, <clears throat> and I think the other element to that also has to do with the link between religion and conspiracy theory, which is what Hofstadter in his, um, in his classic study of the paranoid style of American, um, American politics um, seems to point towards, where people who see things, see the world in black and white or in good and evil are more likely to, uh, to believe in conspiracy theories than those who don't. And I suppose there's an element of, of one way of trying to master the world. If one sees things in black and white, then it's easier to understand the world rather than actually taking it as being pretty arbitrary and contingent, um, etc. So those are the two strands in terms of I think, the genealogy of conspiracy theory that, um, that uh, Alfred and I will collaborate on working on. The final strand that has to do with political theory, um, and it's more to do with the constitutive links then between conspiracy theory and democracy. And um, <clears throat> it's often the case we think of conspiracy theory as kind of undermining the democratic process. But I, I kind of have a hunch that maybe actually it serves a specific role within democracy in the way that in the past societies, religion used to play a certain role. So if there was a famine or if there was a loss of war and the government could no longer explain why there was a case, people took refuge in the sense that they were saying, oh, this is God and we didn't, we didn't behave in the right manner. Um, and there's, I do wonder whether there's a kind of parallel in the way conspiracy theories are thought of specifically within a democratic regime, because a democratic regime, the people are supposed to rule and thus... The question becomes, well, if we want to, we voted, we've elected these kind of politicians on this platform, why is it the case that this doesn't come about in the way that we want it to come about? And one way of kind of explaining that and reconciling oneself with the democratic system in a certain way to say, well, there's actually this world elite, this new world order, which, um, <clears throat> which just means that we cannot have exactly what we have, what we want. Um, but that's one way of explaining why the desires of the people that are supposed to be expressed through the democratic regime do not come through in the way that they would want them to come through. Um, so that's, that's, that's one element um, I, want to, I want to look at. The other element which has come out in, um, in some of the recent work and um, some of the recent articles I've been looking at is this idea of the link between conspiracy, th uh, conspiracy theories and relationship to authority. So one of these papers I was reading recently was arguing that people are more likely to believe in con contradictory conspiracy theories than in the official line. So the examples were Diana. 
people were more likely to believe that both it was a plot, you know, by the secret services, but also that she may still be alive, rather than the official line of them saying, oh, it was a car crash. So they're more likely to believe contradictory conspiracy theories than the official line. And this has to do with a link with the kind of rejection of authority. And I think this is quite, this, this, so I think there's quite a strong link between this kind of rejection of authority and democracy, because you think of rejection of authority as being part of the democratic mindset. You do not believe what authority says because you believe that it's the people who really know um, what the truth is. So I think there's a constitutive link there that I, um, that, I want to, uh, that I want to explore. And the other side of it has to do with democracy is obviously there's kind of much more information available. So you can tell your own story, which is going to be different than the story that the government or the state or whatever may be telling you. But I think this is part of the rejection of authority, um, which I'm interested in kind of, and trying to study. The final point then is just to try to draw a comparison between modern, the modern relationship between democracy and conspiracy theory, and perhaps the ancient understanding of democracy and also conspiracy. Um, and the kind of the, the hunch is that maybe it's the case that ancient democracy is the first regime that actually legitimizes and legalizes conspiracy as a mode of doing politics. You have all these different groups within the assemblies and they're kind of conspiring against one another to have power. And that may be, that's kind of legalized and formalized in a way that beforehand, if you're trying to overthrow the tyrant, then it always looks like an illegal conspiracy. Um, and I think that's an interesting way of thinking about it. And I want to use that then as a counterpoint to try to understand modern um, democracy and its relationship to conspiracy theory.